Well, hello and welcome to North Star Oasis. I'm your host, Jeff Williams, and we're here for another jam-packed, action-filled information overload just for you. Uh, we're starting today's show on the Ides of March, March 15th, 2018. Now, if you don't know your history, the Ides of March, uh, that was the date in, I believe it was 44 BC, when uh, Julius Caesar's wife had told him, be, or, or somebody with Julius Caesar told him, Beware of the Ides of March, and that was the day that Julius Caesar was dead. So anyhow, it is the Ides of March today, and speaking of death, uh, we have an important announcement regarding a company in the retail industry. Uh, there is a death to another major big box retailer. We're going to highlight that today. But honestly, this may actually be one of the most important shows that we have ever done, if I can present this material the proper way because it really speaks a lot to where we're at in our economy today. And I believe we are starting to come out of a 25-year cycle. Yes. And the 25-year cycle we were in has not been good. So before we begin talking about cycles and economy and all of that, we're going to start looking with today's Prager University segment to kind of set things up about taxes killing small businesses. No matter where you come from, what your job is, or where you stand politically, you have to pay taxes. Uncle Sam needs taxpayer dollars to pay for things like schools, firefighters, and the military. There are all sorts of different taxes, income taxes, payroll taxes, and sales taxes, just to name a few. But individuals aren't the only ones who pay taxes. Businesses pay income taxes too. Businesses that are set up as corporations pay taxes on their income at the U.S. corporate tax rate of about 35%, one of the highest in the developed world. Countries like Ireland and Switzerland have corporate taxes well under 25%, which can give companies based there a competitive advantage. But there's another tax group that we're forgetting, small businesses. There are 29 million of them in the U.S., and they employ nearly 56 million people. That's a total of 85 million people dependent on the success of small businesses. Small businesses are most often set up as sole proprietorships, partnerships, or another designation called an S-Corp. But the money they make isn't taxed at the corporate rate. The profits earned by these small businesses are passed through to the owner and counted as individual income on their personal tax return. That's why you might hear small businesses referred to as pass-throughs. These entrepreneurs can pay tax rates as high as 40%, not including additional state and local taxes. That means many American small businesses are being taxed at a higher rate than businesses anywhere in the world. Why should you care? Because high taxes hurt small businesses' ability to grow and expand, causing them to raise prices or even trim jobs to stay within their budget constraints. Lowering taxes for small businesses or pass-throughs results in the growth of small businesses, allowing them to provide more jobs and boost the economy for everyone. After all, two-thirds of all new jobs come from small businesses, and lowering taxes can have a big effect on the entire economy for all Americans. So the next time you hear someone supporting an increase in tax rates on businesses, remember that very important group of small business owners and the 85 million people dependent on their success. To subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now it is, of course, the dream of most small businesses to grow their company and to become big businesses. That's only a natural progression. What happens when you become a big business and you actually acquire a lot of cash? And I hear my libertarian friends talk all the time about, oh, that evil Bank of America. I actually hear my liberal Democrat friends talk about the evil Bank of America also. But when you get to a certain threshold, companies like Amazon and Google and, well, Microsoft used to do this, they would go out and buy other companies and they would increase the, you know, their holdings. Um, what do you do when you're flush with cash? You gotta do something. So you can either start off, uh, start another company, uh, you can increase your empire or you can pay people more. There's a lot of things you can do when your company is flush with cash. If you are a small business, you struggle. You struggle mainly because of taxes, which is one of the reasons why I was a big proponent of the tax cuts back in December, because tax cuts for businesses, small businesses, individuals, and corporations help the United States economy. 
honestly, the United States economy. Personally, I really don't care as much about the global economy as I do the United States economy because I do know that the United States consumer buying power is what generates the uh, wealth of the world. It really, really does. Uh, if U.S. consumers are buying and they have the money to buy, then other countries end up benefiting as well. And I keep hearing this line from the uh, from economists about how if you devalue our dollar, it makes American goods more attractive to the rest of the world. The fallacy behind that argument is if you de uh, have a decline in value of the American dollar intentionally set by the uh, government, uh, then what happens is the other countries start following suit and they start debasing their currency to keep in line with us. So nothing ever changes except a race to the bottom and everybody becomes poor. So now news came out today that another big retailer is liquidating this time, not just Chapter 11, but uh, reorganization, but they are actually liquidating their company. And that is, let's take a look. I don't want to grow up, find a toy to wreck it. They got a million toys and toys to wreck that I can play with. I don't want to grow up, I'm a toy to wreck it. Toys are a store. Jeffrey and his family will be waiting at the door. When you think of toys for the family, think of our store. When you think of toys, think of toys. Oh, there. If it's a new and hot toy, it's a toy they've got. And the prices are hard to beat. I don't want to grow up. Cause if I did, you couldn't be a toy the us kids. More the world's biggest toys. Let's go. Toys R Us. You'll never... Yes, Toys R Us is going away. The company is being liquidated. Uh, now, Toys R Us as a brand can actually come back. Somebody would actually have a desire to open up a chain of toy stores again and then end up buying the trade name and all the branding that, is, that uh, goes with Toys R Us. And it can be done. Uh, Eastern Air, that's been done with Eastern Airlines. As a matter of fact, Francis Ford Coppola, the uh, film director, he ended up buying the Ingle Nook Winery in California, which uh, dates back to 1871. That's the one that put uh, Napa Valley on the map. And over time, he had acquired the rest of the estate from when it had been uh, uh, sold off in pieces. And then eventually he was able to pay for the trade names to get Ingle Nook uh, back. And the, the winery is uh, now called Ingle Nook once again and has been for a few years. But the fact is, you, you know, the trade names actually do have a value. So somebody could buy the trade name, but it's going to be a completely different company if they do. Uh, but there's a reason why. Toys R Us is going away. And it's the same reason that Macy's has had to scale back uh, their operations. It's the same reason that Sears might be going away soon. We'll cover Sears a little bit later. Uh, there are reasons behind all of this, and that's kind of what we want to explain a little bit of the why before the what, as Joe Bastardi from Weatherbell Analytics would say. Um, so, what is causing the demise of Toys R Us? And it's corporate debt. That's all it is. Let's take a look at this story. I uh, cannot remember. This is, I think, Pittsburgh. It might be either Pittsburgh or uh, Buffalo. Uh, let's take a look at um, Toys R Us. And I th think this one was last fall. Some of these clips you're going to see today came out in November, just before the holiday season, and some of them came out like now. Uh, I just can't remember which one is which. So let's take a look now about Toys R Us bankruptcy protection. Bring up that chart again on my Bloomberg. The idea that we were trading at almost par just a couple of weeks ago and have rolled down to 19 cents on the dollar. I just have a basic question. Why did no one really see this coming, Noel? Well, I think the reason nobody saw it coming is because it didn't really necessarily need to happen. Uh, it was really sort of the hiring of Kirkland and Ellis, the association of that to restructuring, I think, caused a lot of uh, fear within the vendor community. And, you know, as you may know, I mean, the lifeblood of the retail sector is really being able to kind of work with your vendors, and particularly into the holiday season for somebody like Toys R Us, making sure you're able to do that with payables, i.e. the vendors give you financing. Once that kind of goes away, it makes it tough for any retailer to 
to sort of survive that sort of immediate liquidity crunch, which is what happened here. No, when we read the uh, the obituary for for Toys R Us, of course, the brand may well make a, a big comeback, even though they do go through bankruptcy, they might not disappear. When we read that obituary, do we read that Amazon killed Toys R Us, or do we read that a buyout back in 2005 killed Toys R Us because they drowned in their own debt and couldn't invest in the company? Well, I think you read a little bit of both, right? I think, you know, it's interesting to note that, I mean, Toys R Us, you know, they were actually one of Amazon's early partners on the toy side back in 06, 07, and they kind of broke away. Toys R Us really actually has a great opportunity to be sort of the best buy of their sector because you, you do have sort of survivors in these sort of single verticals. Uh, the problem is they never really developed that infrastructure, but certainly the debt was an issue. Part of the reason they don't have that infrastructure is because all the debt servicing costs prohibited them from investing in the CapEx they needed to really build this business for the future. So that's part of what this reorg's about. Yeah, and let's just take a look for perspective what that debt looks like. If you come inside the Bloomberg here, it's C-A-S-T go, and it just shows uh, the purple is total capital leases, but this huge blue bar here is senior unsecured bonds uh, outpaces total capital. You got subordinated debt at about uh, seven times EBITDA. Noel, how does this shake out over the next, what, 12 to 18 months? Well, I'm certainly, I think they're probably hoping it's going to be quicker than 12 to 18, but I think it's going to get very complicated just because you have not only all that debt, but all that debt is scattered across all kinds of different pieces. You've got holding company, you've got U.S., you've got this entity called True Taj, you've got the property companies, et cetera. All those people are going to be in the pool fighting for value, residual value of what's left, particularly out of the property companies. So it's going to get a little bit convoluted here, but I think at the end of the day, you know, what you end up with is, at least in the U.S., you're going to end up with a slightly smaller retailer I don't see them closing a ton of stores out of this uh, and then internationally those operations aren't part of the filing so those are all probably going to be okay seven now it so that's what's happening here is the 2005 leverage buyout coupled with the uh, increase in competition from Amazon that's what you have for leaving Toys R Us bankrupt there's another factor at play there honestly is and this comes back out of what we had just seen. During this, uh, when I say just seen, what we've just experienced, take a look at what happened when the leverage buyout occurred in 2000. Well, actually, before we do that, uh, I've got one more Toys R Us clip. So let's just go right to that one, and then I'll explain. Seven now, it's game over for Toys R Us. The company will sell or close all of its stores in the U.S., leaving the futures of tens of thousands of workers in jeopardy. Brenda Waters is live this morning with those details. Brenda. Good morning. A couple of workers just went inside this Toys R Us here in Ross a few minutes ago, probably uh, putting the finishing touches on closing the store. The signs are already in the window. But the folks who went in there and everyone else who works in there will soon be joining about 30,000 other people across the country looking for jobs. The iconic Toys R Us retail chain has sold uh, toys and games to millions of children for generations. But after filing for bankruptcy in September and suffering through a terrible holiday shopping season, the company decided yesterday to call it quits by closing or selling all of its stores across the country. Now, the business opened back in 1948 as a small store in Washington, D.C. Cribs, strollers, and other baby items were sold. Eventually, though, it grew into to more than 2,000 stores. The company is also selling its Babies Are Us stores across the country. Liquidation will take place over the next few months as the shelves are cleared in more than 700 stores across the country. There are about a dozen Toys R Us and Babies Are Us stores in the Pittsburgh area. Reporting live this morning in Ross, Brenda Waters, KDKA TV News. That was the story. I thought was coming from Pittsburgh. Uh, when, when I put this together, sometimes the Twin Cities media does not always cover the, some of the stories that are pertinent to our discussion, so I have to reach out to differing markets. But it doesn't matter in a national story like this if the stores are located in Pittsburgh or if the stores are located in the Twin Cities because the result is the same. The result is Toys R Us is going away. Now, I wanted to explain a couple of things here. Um, as we uh, roll into the next section of the show. A lot of this goes back to, believe it or not, 1993. It goes back to the Clinton administration. 
And this also in, in, in this discussion includes the uh, recent decision for increasing steel tariffs uh, by the Trump administration. Now, let me explain. So there's a couple of things that are at work here, but we're going to go back to the Clinton administration and their changing of the Community Reinvestment Act. That is one of the big things that led to the slowdown in the housing market starting in 2004 and into 2005 and 6. And we remember the economy when it was too big to fail. A lot of that was stemmed from the housing market. And, you know, it goes back to Clinton administration changing the Community Reinvestment Act. Once you have a plethora of housing surplus, you have displaced homes, people who are overhead, or, or they're uh, underwater is the, the term, there's too much debt and not enough uh, home value. So people were trapped, consumers were trapped. Then that helped lead to a bigger recession. And when it was a bigger recession, what happened? Consumer spending declines. That's what happened from the Community Reinvestment Act. That goes back to a legacy holdover from Bill Clinton's administration. But there's another legacy holdover from Clinton's administration, and it is one that I was only recently made aware of. Back during Bill Clinton's administration, he had increased the regulations on steel companies and manufacturers. Increased the regulations. Now, at the same time that that occurred, they cut the overseas tariffs. We have today a steel, global steel surplus on the market. Steel jobs and steel manufacturing have been leaving America for the last 25 years. Only now, as we've, in, we've kind of got back to balance for where it was prior to the Clinton administration changes, President Trump has reduced a lot of the regulations. He is now increasing the tariffs. And what's happening, we're seeing that balance go back to the way it was prior to the Clinton administration changes. And there's a steel mill in uh, Illinois that's going to be opening up. I think another one in Pennsylvania is going to be opening up. And now, a lot of people are telling me, oh, but it's going to have some spinoffs to other industries. Yes, that may be true. I'm not going to deny that we could be in a trade war and that this could have some devastating effects to other industries. That's a possibility that will play itself out here in the near future. But what also happened in the, around uh, 2005? Around the time as we were getting into an economic slowdown on the housing industry and we were going into recession, we had a bunch of leveraged buyouts that were occurring because the economy was then kind of at the peak. So companies like uh, well, uh, Eddie Lampert from Sears ended up buying Kmart and then he took Kmart and bought Sears and merged them together into Sears Holdings so he owned Sears and Kmart. Macy's was the subject of a leverage buyout around the same time. Toys R Us was the subject of a leverage buyout. All of this stuff happened when the private equity market saw potential and saw opportunity in retail marketplace and big box retailers and went after them with leveraged buyouts and then the economy slowed down. Now, let's take a look at what is a leveraged buyout, just to gain a little bit of perspective. I'm not going to give you a whole economics uh, class here as far as uh, we're gonna pick apart a leveraged buyout so you could do one, but I wanna give you that brief overview right now before we go on the next subject of discussion. Welcome to the Investors Trading Academy, talking glossary of financial terms and events. Our word of the day is leverage buyout. The use of a target company's asset value to finance most or all of the debt incurred in acquiring the company. This strategy enables a takeover using little capital. However, it can result in considerably more risk to owners and creditors. See also hostile leveraged buyout, reverse leveraged buyout. Case study leveraged buyouts, known as an LBO, became popular in the 1980s when firms such as Beatrice Companies, Swift, ARA Services, Levi Strauss, Jack Eckhart and Danny's were acquired and then were taken private. 
With an LBO, a firm's management often borrows funds using a firm's assets as collateral. The borrowed money is used to purchase the entire firm's outstanding stock. As a result, a small group of individuals is able to take control of the firm without using any or much of the group's members' own money. Following the buyout, the new owners frequently attempt to cut costs and sell assets in order to make the increased debt more manageable. Because the group initiating the LBO must pay a premium for the stock over the market price, an LBO nearly always benefits the stockholders of the firm to be acquired. However, investors holding bonds of the acquired company are likely to see their relative position deteriorate because of the increased debt taken on by the company. For example, the leveraged buyout of R.H. Macy & Co. produced a $16 jump in the price of its common stock at the same time as the price of its debt securities fell. Most bondholders have no recourse to the increased risks they face because of the greater resultant debt. Greater so that's a top-line primer of what happens here. Investors come in and they pledge the assets of the company for the loans. Then they cut. We've seen this with the newspaper industry. What's happened with the, uh, with the St. Paul Pioneer Press? They used to be owned by Knight Ritter. The Pioneer Press, they uh, had an activist investor who came in and pretty much said, sell off Knight Ritter, all your, all your papers. And they did that. And then McClatchy bought them. And then they, McClatchy ended up selling them. And some things are consolidated. And now uh, it's like First Digital Media now owns the Pioneer Press with about 110 other newspapers. But these guys are not in it for running a newspaper any more than Eddie Lampert is in Sears for running retail. Or in retail for running Sears. These guys want to maximize their profit, and they have the money to invest to do so. So they cut and sell off, uh, cut, uh, cut employees. They sell off assets of the company, and then they're still left with trying to make things, you know, things happen. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with leveraged buyouts. There, there isn't. It's actually a good vehicle if you know what you're doing. In running an L LBO, I don't know what I'm doing, but I do know what it is. So I'm not trying to do an LBO. Uh, but the fact is, a lot of companies start off by people who know that business. If you are in retail and you manage retail and you know retail, you know that business. You may not know about finances, that's why you hire a chief financial officer. But if a money person comes in who has no understanding of the business, all they look at is the sum of the parts. The whole equals the sum of the parts. So you sell off the, sum, the parts and eventually you have the sum, but then what do you have left? Now, of course, if you're really trying to increase the value of the company, you do need to hope in the case of a toy retailer like Toys R Us or a general merchandiser like Sears, you do need to hope that the consumers will still continue to come to your company. You still have to hope that the economy is strong enough to be able to allow consumers to buy your goods so you can pay off that debt and turn a profit. And that's what's happening in this case. Yes, you have more online competition. There's no doubt that you have Amazon as the big uh, gorilla of retail today. But not every, not every consumer wants to go to Amazon or online to buy their, their product because there's still an immediate gratification in the society. They do not want to pay for shipping, and when I say they, the customers, customers don't want to pay for shipping, and customers do not want to wait for the product if they can get it in a local store at around the same price as they would buy online. And I've actually read studies that do actually show that there is a large trend that that does happen. The problem that you have for a lot of retailers, uh, or one of many problems, is the fact that they have a hard time competing on price. Part of it's the leveraged buyouts. Oh, well, we got to keep our prices high enough because we got to pay off this debt. At the same time, you're squeezing out the customers. So it's a double-edged sword there. But when you have an $8 billion takeover in 2005, and then the housing market goes down, then what happened right when we started recovering from that? The consumers were already feeling the pinch. Then President Obama became, uh, then Barack Obama became president. And then immediately, excuse me, then immediately ended up uh, increasing our national debt, making our, va our dollar valuation even lower. 
and we extend our, our uh, recovery time was extended pretty much throughout its entire term. We had less than 3% quarterly growth in this country for over eight years. That had never happened. So how is a company like Toys R Us or how is a company like Macy's going to be able to continue to pay off their LBO debt if the economy is not strong enough to bring in the customers who are all belt tightening to give them that extra money they need to pay off the debt? Well, why do you think we're seeing companies like Macy's and Toys R Us either cutting stores or, in, in Toys R Us case, liquidating? That's what's happening. I'm not surprised by this. Sears, they're going through a similar thing, but for a different reason. And now we're going to take a look at what happened to America's favorite company. Hi, I'm Bill Padalon, the founding editor here at Money Morning, and I'm here to tell you a story. I bet you remember the, the Sears wish book that came out, the Christmas catalog that came out every year. I mean, families, you know, the kids, like, you know, my, my sisters and I spent hours poring over that catalog that, that with its glossy pages. It was as thick as a phone book. I mean, it became a wish list for everything you wanted to get that year for Christmas or for your birthday or that you dreamed to one day get, even if you knew you wouldn't. This is a company that's been around for generations and it was once one of the most successful companies in America. Now, you fast forward to today. That's all changed. The Sears we once knew is gone. It's now one of the most troubled companies in America, and there are very specific reasons that this has happened. In fact, I'm going to give you six reasons why Sears is on its way down and can't be saved. The first one, which we're all familiar with, is the rise of e-commerce. You know, look, we all know that Amazon has become a monster. It's, it's, it's put the hurt on retailers across the board. Foot traffic in malls is down. Uh, retailers are hurting. Your conventional retailers are hurting. The department store is not, is not the stalwart that it once was. And Sears has suffered in kind. You know, its, it's revenue is down. It hasn't made money since 2010. It's closing stores, and that's still not enough. The second thing is something I like to call the lease overhang. You know, years ago, uh, Sears thought it was intelligent to sign 99-year leases, and a lot of these leases still have, you know, 40, 50 years to run. You know, it, they're not easy to get out of. You know, they're, an, they're an overhang that Sears has to deal with. They're a financial liability that, that's, that, that, that's putting a crimp on the company's ability to maneuver and get itself out of the situation it's in right now. The third one is something I like to call the incredible shrinking gadget. You know, today, a stereo is an iPod you stick in your pocket. But years ago, it was a giant console that took up an entire wall in your living room. You know, store, big department stores had to have a lot of room. They had to be big to house, you know, TV consoles, uh, stereo consoles, you know, big furniture. All that has changed, though, and now these stores are finding it, you know, finding it very difficult to find things to fill that cavernous space that's left over. You know, but because of those leases, they're not able to shrink themselves down or to minimize their space, and that has created a major challenge for the store. The next one is something I call the specialist era. If you think about it, you know, if you go shopping, I mean, if you're going to a physical store and not shopping online, if you want sporting goods, you go to Dick's. If you want jewelry, you go to Kay's. If you want electronics, you go to Best Buy. Now, Sears is a general merchandiser, and the problem with that is, well, it's general. I mean, it, it doesn't have the best of anything. It kind of has the things that are fast movers, but maybe not the really cool, new, jazzy things that people are really looking for when they come into a store. And, the, and on top of that, as a general merchandiser, it has to compete with companies like Walmart, which are much more powerful, which can offer better prices and which have a greater marketing reach. And that puts Sears at a severe disadvantage. The next thing is something I call the dump. We talked a couple minutes ago about the strong brands and the, and the, and the great ancillary businesses Sears had. It got rid of all of them. It, it sold off its Craftsman tool line to Black & Decker. You know, it's, it's dumped its Colwell Banker unit. It sold off Dean Witter. It sold off its credit card business. All these things were aimed at creating like short-term uh, shareholder returns, but they, did, they, were the, they were the parts of the business that generated profits, that generated growth, and now those are gone. And the last factor, number six, has probably been the biggest factor of all in Sears' demise. I call it the Lampert effect. I'm talking about CEO Eddie Lampert. Eddie Lampert is a financier. He's not a retail guy. He doesn't understand merchandising or marketing or what people want when they come into a store. And he hasn't been able to bring in and retain a retail CEO that's been able to transform the company. 
Lampert has run this company solely for the shareholder. Think about it. I mean, he was buying back stock at a, at a point in time when the shares were trading at 170 bucks each. I mean, recently they were down to eight dollars. I mean, this is this was not a great use of Sears's cash. That's money that could have been plowed back into modernized stores to improve merchandise, to uh, to, to upgrade their information systems, and to make Sears a competitive retailer and to keep it at the forefront of, of American retailing. I'm often asked, you know. Bill, you know, what do I do about Sears stock? I got to be honest with you. Despite my personal connection with the company, this is not a stock that I would buy right now. Not even with this news that Kenmore appliances are going to be sold through Amazon. That's just a blip on, on, a, on a, a downward sp uh, spiral. It's not going to stop anything. It's not going to impede what's, what the ultimate end is going to be. This is a brand that's going to disappear. It's going to go by the wayside, and there's, at this point, there is nothing that can be done to stop it. So those are some contributions to the reason why Sears is going under. Now I'm going to take a look real quick from a Fortune, well maybe, uh, there we go, from uh, Fortune Magazine from a year ago uh, regarding Eddie Lampert and Sears. Um, by the end of 2016, Eddie Lampert's hedge fund, and he's a hedge fund guy, money guy, uh, his hedge fund held only six hundred and fifty three million dollars that's a ninety four percent decline from the sixteen and a half billion dollars that it once managed when uh, at its peak right after the Sears acquisition in 2007 now keep in mind it was acquired in 2005 but two years later um, that's a heck of a decline now, he has sold off uh, a lot of the assets, Kenmore, uh, uh, Craftsman and Kenmore, the two big uh, things. He even changed Kenmore, uh, went away from Whirlpool and took on, I think, LG as a, a manufacturer. The LG products were for, under uh, the Kenmore brand were not as good as the Whirlpool. I understand lately that Whirlpool is back into making Kenmore pro appliances for the, whoever owns Kenmore today. Uh, Lampert, again, was not a retail guy. Um, his stake in Sears, let's see, oh, this is the part I wanted to get at here. Um, Lampert had become a majority Sears stakeholder in 2004 and later helped engineer the company's merger with Kmart in 2005. By the time the merger had been completed, Lampert's stake in Sears was worth $8.6 billion, amounting to a mass of 72% of his portfolio. And that wasn't the end of his glory days. Uh, by two, early 2007, those same shares had grown 29% in value to $11.1 billion, or 67% of his portfolio at the time. So what keeps Sears going is the fact that it was a hedge fund uh, that used its own assets to purchase Sears and Kmart, unlike Toys R Us, which had to uh, rely on uh, other debt holders and uh, had no way of backing that debt. That's why you know, even though Sears has been kind of on the decline for years and everybody's known it, Toys R Us is more rapid of a decline because, you know, Eddie Lampert has at least been able to provide Sears some stability. However, when the financial recession hit Sears as it did with, uh, hit Sears as it did with other retailers, Lampert's own fund suffered heavily and now the investor and CEO appears to be losing faith in the idea of ever making his money back. And Sears acknowledged uh, last week, and that was a year ago, that substantial doubt exists in its, in, in its ability to continue as a going concern. That's Sears. That's what's happened with Sears. But that's what's happened with all retailers, and a lot of that goes back to government policy set forth by the Bill Clinton administration and doubled down by Barack Obama's administration. And I am going to give some fair criticism to President George W. Bush. His economic policies uh, back in the uh, 2000s did not exactly help matters. You know, and I've, I've criticized him before, I'll criticize him again, uh, and it's fair criticism. If you're not working on behalf of the American people, if you're in the White House, and if you're in Congress, you're going to hurt a lot of people. And that's what's happening. When we have government officials who think more about themselves and more about their friends than they do about the American people, we get things like this. We get things like the Clinton administration changing the rules 
to benefit people who are not Americans. We get the Obama policies that penalize Americans. So is it any wonder why good American companies actually start going out of business right when we're about to recover and right when that ship is getting righted? Not surprised at all by that. The reason I'm not surprised, of course, is because this has been a problem that these companies have been faced with, with kicking the can down the road, hoping things will improve, but then they just ran out of time. That's the way it is. Now, the capitalist in me says something will fill that gap. It always does. There is some hope for the future in retailing. It, you know, I'm not saying that all, all retail is done. No, not at all. I'm not saying bricks and mortar are done. But government policy hurts a lot of people if it's not done right. And that's why I think that the tariffs that are, um, that are being increased, that levels the playing field from where we were at in 93. I think that's a good thing. But I also think that um, companies need to do more to try to pay off that debt as soon as they can to avoid this from happening in the future. So now, what does that hold for that future? Let's take a look at America's changing shopping trends. The year was 1989. Elegance is the word for the evening to match the ambiance of the mall. Shoppers pouring into the newly built mall in Chictawaga. I've already got my credit cards for Baden with Teller and I was looking in the window. The enthusiasm, the excitement, the willingness to buy. But fast forward 28 years and the picture of shopping in western New York is painted with a different brush. Really, it's empty. In the last year, Macy's has closed at the Eastern Hills Mall in Clarence and McKinley Mall in Blaisdell. And just in December, Sears revealed plans to close at the Boulevard Mall in Amherst and the Walden Galleria in Cheektowaga. The Boulevard Mall is also up for sale, leaving its future uncertain. It's trends like these that Charles Lindsay, an associate professor at the University at Buffalo School of Management, says are expected to continue. You're going to see more store closings by traditional department stores. You're going to see uh, you're going to see some malls go out of business. The obvious reason: e-commerce and the boom in online shopping. I think with online, it's just a, a new generation. Professor Lindsay says Amazon is now worth more than Kohl's, Target, J.C. Penney, Sears, and Barnes and Noble combined, cashing out at an estimated $400 billion and taking cash away from local big box stores. A part of it is just the new generation. They have all this technology and then it's easier for them to do it that way. But despite this trend, management here at the Eastern Hills Mall tells me it's at 98% capacity and the former Macy's here will soon be filled with something else, although the mall isn't saying who. The Walden Galleria, which will soon lose Sears, also says it has two new big tenants scheduled scheduled to open this year. But with more and more shoppers looking for deals, retailers still need to find a way to compete. And I think that's one reason that TJ Maxx and uh, and uh, Marshalls uh, have, have done okay. They've managed to hold their own. Paint for us the picture what you see the next five to ten years for retail looking like. I think the future is going to see not only stores continue to close, uh, retail retailers and retail brands continue to close stores, but to start to start to, and this is already happening, repurpose uh, stores. Lindsay says stores will continue to downsize and set up shop in mixed use facilities offering living space and restaurants. In Buffalo, Hannah Bueller, 7 Eyewitness News. There's one other thing that a lot of the mall based retailers are not doing. They're not advertising, at least not like they used to. Um, here's one of the other trends. It used to be a day when the Sunday newspaper was a big thing because everybody would get it and you would advertise in the Sunday paper. This, the newspapers aren't quite, uh, they're having their own problems. And part of that's online competition and part of that is their own management decisions. Like, you know, with uh, Digital First uh, buying the Pioneer Press and not really caring about the paper. So what happens? You're not, if their traditional outlets for advertising are going by the wayside, and if you're in a mall, there used to be an inherent assumption in mall-based shopping that everybody would show up at the mall because that's where everyone went. It doesn't exist anymore. Maybe for some malls. I mean, I occasionally will go to the Mall of America and I'll see a lot of people. But then I'll go to the Maplewood Mall and it'll be empty. Who wants to go to an empty mall? 
And then Maplewood Mall, I think, compared to Rosedale, is a little bit darker as far as the atmosphere. I'm not talking, you know, creepy dark, but literally the lighting is not as bright. So there's no reason for me to go to Maplewood Mall and then stores start closing. And I'm not just saying me, but, you know, other uh, consumers. If consumers aren't going there, then people aren't getting a chance to get the traffic. But then the retailers inside the malls aren't necessarily advertising to the local community. So if people aren't going to the mall, they don't know that that retailer is there, and then the retailer's not advertising, and it becomes a downward spiral for both. So now, let's take a look at retail's future on brick and mortar versus e-commerce. Is there a chance that this tide is turning between online versus brick and mortar? Oh, I don't think so, not at all. I think that the, uh, the, the shift has certainly taken place, and uh, the Buying online is, is a huge part of the business today. Continues to grow, and, uh, and I think that, uh, in fact, the mall traffic has been heading south for a long time. Fewer shoppers out there, and uh, in the end, the e-commerce business will continue to grow dramatically. So how much can it grow? Because I, you know the numbers probably better than I do, but I think it's roughly 20% right now of, of all retail is online. So it's actually not the majority. We always That's hear correct. about Amazon. It's actually not a majority of what's being bought. That's correct. So how far will it keep going? Will it take over 100%, 80%? No, I think people still like to go into and shop and touch and feel. So there'll always be retailers out there, brick and mortar retailers. However, um, when you looked at the fleet of shopping centers in the United States, and say there are about a thousand of them, there are about 300 that are outstanding shopping centers um, that that will really continue to grow and prosper. There are about 300 that are at the bottom of the list that probably will close over the next horizon, five to ten years, and in the middle there are about 400 or so uh, that will continue to exist but they'll be repurposed over time so there will be there will be a continu continuity of retail shopping but it'll just be different Joe I want to pick up on one of the things you just said and that was that consumers still want to go in and look and touch and feel that's great but what if the consumer goes into a shop let's say Bloomingdale's or Macy's looks touches and feels and then goes on a website elsewhere and buys elsewhere it's not so good for Bloomingdale's or Macy's well, that's is exactly it? what they do because there's what are they doing when they go on on their phone they're shopping for price yeah so if you're competitive in price and Bloomingdale's has it you could take it home immediately so it's all the, the e-commerce initiatives online shopping is, is really all about the price equalization and it puts the consumer in demand. Joe, is there a hybrid play here? Is it not a binary choice? I mean, Because you hear a Walmart or something saying, you can order it and then come pick it up. Well, Walmart's done a brilliant job of transforming themselves. And uh, they, you know, they purchased uh, Jet.com about a year and a half ago, and that's really made a huge difference for them. They're, they're in this transformation. Uh, the, the gentleman from uh, uh, Jet.com, Mark Lowy, he's a disruptor, he's an innovator, and he's moving them in new directions, and it's really been working for them. So let's break down uh, different segments of the retail market because the traditional JCPenney, <coughs> Macy's, we know they did not do well. The Walmart continues to hold up. Home Depot holds up. Up. But the younger retailer segment actually doing pretty well, like Urban Outfitters, Gap. Walk us through the trajectory for those groups. I think they're doing better against uh, very low comparisons from the past. And where are they doing better? When they report their numbers, they're not saying what the brick and mortar uh, penetration is. They're looking at a, a total mix of channel, you know, of channel assortments. They're looking at domestic business, international business, online business, wholesale, retail. I think companies that are doing all those things have a good opportunity. If you're just a vertical uh, retailer in the United States selling apparel or accessories, I think you're in a very difficult place. So there's no doubt that we uh, have, okay, Dallas, which one am I on? Okay, I'm on this one. All right. There's no doubt that the retail segment has challenges. The online world has you know, reduced the price. That, of course, reduces the profitability. It's not like it used to be when the uh, bigger department stores had all the power and the consumers didn't. That's actually a good thing for consumers, but businesses like Toys R Us have to accommodate for that, and unfortunately for them, they haven't. Uh, other, uh, Barnes & Noble, I mean, that's a company I actually studied pretty intently uh, when I was 
doing my uh, portfolio for my MBA, and they uh, have to work really hard at reinventing themselves. And it would not surprise me if we start seeing more and more store closures coming up in the next few years with Barnes & Noble, because the book market is also facing the same kind of competition because of Amazon and other online booksellers. And there's only so much shelf space that you can have with inventory that doesn't move. So that's another challenge entirely. But if we have a strong dollar and we have a good consumer sentiment and retailers are actually competing for the uh, customer's attention and money, then things go good. But when something goes out of balance, this is the kind of stuff that uh, happens. But now let's take a look at the decline of the U.S. malls because, as I just mentioned, you know, there's a huge difference in the way things were just at the Maplewood Mall alone, much less some of the others. So let's take a look at the decline of the U.S. mall culture. The bells of the holidays, the pageantry, the dollars, marking the beginning of the spending season for American consumers. As the largest shopping mall in the United States, the aptly named Mall of America draws 42 million visitors a year. But scenes like this are the exception. Few malls double as tourist destinations, and many around the country now look like this. Well, what's really changed is the way that people shop. Uh, when malls in the U.S. were new back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, we didn't have social media. You couldn't shop on your phone. I just don't like all that hectic, you know, shopping at the mall or, or just shopping in general. It's just easier to do it online now. According to the industry analyst Green Street Advisors, more than 20 American shopping malls have closed since 2010, and 60 more are on the brink of closure. That's led many to wonder whether this symbol of American consumerism will one day disappear altogether. Nicholas Eckert began photographing declining shopping malls when the one in his hometown closed in 2005. We've seen this trend of malls being abandoned, letting fall apart, being torn down. Gone are the days of malls as a neighborhood's default gathering place. In the last decade, department stores that once anchored malls have closed in the face of online competition, and then smaller retailers have fled in turn. I think that's really just a part of how our society has really just become a disposable society. We just build something, then when it gets old, we just get rid of it. Jeff Gunning of the design firm Callison RTKL specializes in helping malls turn the old into the new. He says malls must diversify and incorporate technology to stay in business. We really think the mall of the future will be a shoppable, mixed-use entertainment destination. It's a place where you can shop, but shopping isn't necessarily the main attraction. People will come to malls for more reasons. He says the Mall of America owes its success to its focus on entertainment. And malls in the future may be part outdoor park or even drone ports where driverless cars deliver shoppers to the front door. An iconic uh, visionary element on the landscape. An optimistic view for an endangered culture. Heidi Jo Castro, Al Jazeera, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Well, I don't know about driverless cars. I'm not sure if we're going to get to driverless cars or drones, but there's definitely going to be some changes. And obviously the uh, retailers will have to do something more and the malls will have to do more. Try advertising uh, in order to, um, to uh, pick up the pace. Now, I've given you some of my reasons. Let's take a look at what some of the others have to say about the reasons why malls are, uh, more malls in the U.S. are closing down more than ever. Hundreds of malls have closed over the last several years because people's shopping habits have changed. There was a time in the U.S. when there was a spending frenzy of consumerism and everyone was shopping and shopping malls were 
uh, where everybody spent their time and went on the weekends. You know, we would go to the Auntie Anne's pretzel stand and we would go to Abercrombie and we would walk around the mall and hang out there for hours. Then the recession hit and not only did the spending slow down, but people's values changed. People are now spending more on experiences over things, especially the apparel industry has been hit especially hard. Another big factor that I always consider when we're talking about malls is the rise of technology. When you go online to Amazon, you can read thousands of reviews from people who have had this product, tried it out, maybe had issues with it, maybe have been using it for a year and say it's great. And that's so much more credible as a consumer than what a retail worker is going to tell you. That's just how it is. It's also more convenient. When we talk about e-commerce, that's definitely a huge threat to retailers that have large store bases, but it still accounts for only about 8% of total retail sales. I think that one of the biggest threats to traditional retailers today is just changing shopping habits. It's people really want deep, deep discounts. They're going to places like TJ Maxx, they're going to Amazon, and they're shopping for clothes at Amazon. This is something that people didn't go to Amazon for a couple years ago. Everybody just wants the cheapest price, but also wants the highest quality product. So what's happening is a lot of stores, particularly department stores um, like Sears, Macy's, Kmart's are closing. And what that does to a mall is A, the mall loses its biggest tenant, um, the tenant that's paying the most in rent, um, the most in providing the mall with the money to keep the lights on. And it also severely decreases foot traffic to the mall since most people go to the mall to go to these big, what they're called anchor stores. So when malls close, they just aren't that valuable. It's a lot of space and it's kind of something that no new mall operator wants to take on. So you basically have this huge deserted area. There's nothing going on there. It's very spooky. So a lot of malls are thinking about more like experiential um, attractions that will bring people in, movie theaters, things like that, large restaurants. So I think a lot of malls are betting on that to, to pull more uh, customers in. The whole retail landscape is transforming and malls are no longer really at the center of it. Matt, this story's so now I remember the days of the Maplewood Mall when it was thriving and you had Circus Pizza providing uh, p food and video games and it was an experience. That's gone. I remember the days when uh, you had Maplewood 1 and Maplewood 2. I'm only using the Maplewood Mall as an example because it's one that's a mall I'm, I'm very familiar with, but I've noticed the changes in that mall from what it used to be and where it is today. We used to have the movies at Maplewood, Maplewood 1 and Maplewood 2 theaters. People would go to the mall, then they would go to, go to see a film, or they would do it in reverse order. Or you would go and see a film, and then you would talk with your friends uh, over at Circus Pizza, and then play a few video games, and then maybe go out and buy something from a store inside the mall, and then go, and you had a great day. You spent about five hours with your friends, especially when, you were, when we were younger, and... It was great for everybody, including the retailers. Things have changed. But you look at Rosedale today. Rosedale has built up a lot of restaurants and the AMC movie theaters at their mall location. And why do I see more people when I go into Rosedale than when I go to Maplewood? For that reason alone, the entertainment value. It brings people in, and then people have other options in which to spend their money. So that's been the change in customer preferences, but a lot of that, as I've explained, goes back to the economy. And if you want to have a healthy economy, don't do things like changing the Community Reinvestment Act. Don't borrow excessively as a government and de uh, devalue our currency. Don't intentionally try to devalue our currency as our current Secretary of the Treasury has done uh, because that's just going to start bringing us back into recession even when we are climbing out of one, we're starting to get a stronger economy. So now that begs one question. Is the retail apocalypse starting? Let's find out. Matt, this story is just incredible. I think we all read it and were amazed. Just talk to us about what's going on because I think there's some perception out there that, that perhaps the concerns about retail are being hyped by the media. Yeah, you hear that from the industry. They say that yes. you know, just a couple of big chains that are struggling. We all know those names, JCPenney, Sears, whatever. But if you look at sort of 
what's going on in retail. Like right now we have a pretty healthy economy, consumer confidence is high, but yet all these retailers, even pretty healthy ones, are struggling. Okay, so there's been this term retail apocalypse that's been thrown around. Yes. But if you really look at what's coming, over the next five to seven years, there's an explosion of debt coming due, mm. high yield debt, so that's debt that's riskier, that, that's with retailers that are somewhat struggling already, at a time when overall high yield debt is exploding as well. So what's likely to happen, and again, and again credit markets are likely to tighten, so you're gonna have all this debt coming due for all these struggling retailers exactly when it's gonna be harder to refinance it. And we have a chart yes. here showing some of the distress, some of these department stores, and their extraordinary uh, debt levels. Yes. Uh, who are, what are the type of companies that are sort of most stressed here? Who we have it up here? I mean, the department stores stand out. I mean, this is a chart, basically, this is the, the largest publicly traded department stores in the country. And yes, you know, Sears is d distressed levels, uh, Bonton's at distressed levels, and then the other ones are, are okay right now. Um, and, and, and the reason why this is a big worry is because there's all these potential spillover effects, uh, right? So the retail industry employs the most low-income people in the country. Eight million people are either retail sales or cashiers. These are people making about $20,000 a year. So if more stores go away and less people working in stores, those, those people will be impacted. Then there's all wow. the, and then there's all the states that yeah. rely on retail jobs, and it varies by state. So some states have have benefited more from retail growth, others have lost jobs. So there's, there's a huge impact potential here to the economy that, that we might see over the next five to seven years as this shakes out. And that's what's gonna happen. Things are gonna shake out and they're already starting. And this uh, Bloomberg piece was from November, so you know we're a few months away from, from that and you know that's the way things are going. So, it is important, I think, to really monitor what's going on in retail. And if you just saw the percentage of retail jobs that are out there, that employs a lot of Americans. Now, let's go back to the very beginning of what we, what we started today's show out with about tax cuts and small businesses. I'm a huge proponent of doing business with small businesses. I really am, and I want to see a lot of them grow. I want them to become mid-sized businesses. I want to see them become the big businesses. So things happen in cycles. It's called an economic cycle. And uh, we were gonna actually end today showing you about the economic cycle. We're running out of time. But we only now have uh, 284 shopping days left until Christmas. And so if uh, the Toys R Us near you is still operational, then um, by the time you see this, then you might want to go on out there and get an early start on the Christmas shopping season because you know the uh, deep discount might be coming uh, near you. We are a consumer-driven society. That's not going to change. And I've heard people, Republicans and Democrats alike, over the years decrying how much consumerism there is. Oh, all the consumerism. We spend, spend, spend. We never save, save, save. That's the way it is. That's another show for another day as to why that is, but the fact is we just have to accept that that is the way things are. We're not going to be powerful enough to change it outside of our own sphere of influence. You perhaps might be able to save more or invest more. Same with me. Somebody else may be the one who wants to spend their entire paycheck on uh, Amazon. That's their prerogative, but we are still a very largely consumer-driven society. And that's why the retail industry is something to pay close attention to. And retailers need to spend closer attention paying, uh, looking at shoppers. Anyhow, that's what we've got for this week. Thanks for watching. And we're going to leave you with the uh, last bit of music. A Toys R Us kid. They got the best for so much less. You'll really flip your lid. From bikes to trains to video games. It's the biggest toy store there is. Gee whiz. I don't want to grow up because maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. Once a Toys R Us kid. That's all we got. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next week.